So I love the litmus test of people saying I'm crazy. And the reason they say I'm crazy is they haven't done my research. They haven't, they haven't looked at all the data. They haven't analyzed it the way I have. So really they're looking at it without the benefit of all of that information. I use that craziness as a litmus test as to how good the idea is and whether I should pursue it. You That's got the visionary, you have the psychic, uh, and, and then you have the futurist. And of course, we'll add a fourth here, crazy. <laughs> so yeah, <we're>, exactly. <laughs> well, what's first the difference? Of all, I, I, just a little, let's talk about the visionary for just a minute. And that is um, whenever I have, uh, have an idea for launching a business or doing some new initiative, uh, when I was younger, if my parents and friends thought I was crazy, I knew it was a great idea. I got to go for it. Mm -hmm. If they actually agreed with it and liked it, I knew it wasn't a big enough idea. I wouldn't pursue that. So I love the litmus test of people saying I'm crazy. And the reason they say I'm crazy is they haven't done my research. They haven't, they haven't looked at all the data. They haven't analyzed it the way I have. So really, they're looking at it without the benefit of all of that information that you look at when you do real estate and I look at when I do real estate and other investments as well. So I, uh, I use that craziness as a litmus test as to how good the idea is and whether I should pursue it. That's of course just one litmus <laughs> test. Um, so I think a visionary having vision is really important. And um, I mean, we would probably not have ever gone to the moon back in the 60s if we didn't have visionaries. And I could give you countless examples of, uh, of doing that. <clears throat> but um, visionaries also, I think as an entrepreneur, one of the reasons I like the hard trend, soft trend methodology is it does help you to ground that vision. And this works for futurists as well, to be able to find a way to separate the wheat from the chaff, those things that we know from those things that may or may not happen. And I think that uh, that puts some context to it. As far as uh, psychics go, I think there is a strong case for intuitive insight. And, um, and intuitive insight, now again, whether there's people are, are just seers and can see, I know enough people that kind of do that kind of thing uh, for a living and a lot of it is, uh, it's got a lot of tricks to it to be able to impress you with, with things that actually they can pull out and know about you. But, um, but there is such a thing as intuitive insight. And I think one of the things entrepreneurs have trouble with is knowing, um, you know, I knew that was going to happen, but I didn't act on it. I knew I should have tried that, but I didn't act on it. And once again, that's one of the reasons that I, uh, have, I think so many people uh, and I've got so many followers and so on is because I've got a context that allows them to make sense of those and, and use it as a litmus test. All right, how good an idea is this and which way will it work? So futurist and visionary seem like they're the same thing then in, in many ways. Well, um, you can be a visionary and, uh, and see all kinds of things, but it doesn't mean that it will happen. For example, uh, uh, several years ago, I'll give you an example, an excellent visionary and entrepreneur. Uh, this was about uh, 2018, as a matter of fact, uh, Elon Musk, what he did is he made a prediction. He said by 2025, no car will be sold with steering wheel or a gas pedal or way to control it, they'll all be autonomous. And when he made that prediction, and again, he's a very smart guy, of course, m my response was, well, uh, unfortunately, he will be wrong. Um, that's because he's not looking, in this case, at hard trends and soft trends. And my reasoning, first, I'd like to use something we can all understand. Can you imagine a uh, Lamborghini uh, selling a car uh, with no way to control it? Uh, you just sit in it and let it drive itself. What are they going to do? Say, hey, it's got nice seats? I don't <laughs> think so. And if you're a Porsche driver, I don't think you're going to like that. Actually, I like to drive too. And I've had a Tesla Model X for, uh, since 2016. It can drive itself, not fully autonomous, but fairly well. I, I actually, I drive it more than I put it on automatic because I like to drive. Now, what did I say? We're going to have semi-autonomous is going to be the big thing because I like to drive. I just don't like accidents. And when I'm on a straight road and I'm bored, I'd rather the car drive because frankly, my Tesla can drive better than I can drive. 
when <clears throat> I'm on a straight road or on a highway or something like that, even when it has some turns. So semi-autonomous is the way we'll go for quite a ways. Does that mean there's no fully autonomous? Yes, because one of the principles that I teach, and I'm using this as a teaching moment for all of us, <clears throat> to see the future better, don't think either or, think both and. Either or says, it's either going to be this or that, either full autonomy or no autonomy. Either it's the old technology or the new technology. And the answer is no, it's, it's this and this. The key is in the word integration. If you integrate the old with the new in a way that the integration provides more value than the old or the new by itself, you have a pathway to go from the old to the new. So what I'm really saying is going farther out, not everything will be fully autonomous and a lot of things will be. And when you start using hard trends, you can even predict where the fully autonomous will go first. It already starting to happen. So, so uh, just try to wrap up. Visionaries aren't always right. Yeah. Because you have to have some, uh, you know, some way of in some context for that. And by the way, since then, uh, I can say, uh, thankfully, I've actually had uh, Elon uh, sharing my tweets and things like that. So I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of happy about that. <laughs> that's awesome. And by the way, yeah, Mark Victor Hansen was on last episode. He, that's one, he said, that's one of my role models. <laughs> yeah, he's a role model to many. Oh, uh, yeah, so, sure, so Dan, sorry. Um, so it sounds like the futurist is more like a scientific version of the visionary. It's kind of one step higher. Right. Yeah, I would say for sure, because uh, again, we're talking more about professional futures, because if you if you said right now to all of the podcasters out there, all the people listening to this, uh, we're going to be on the moon uh, by next year. Mm -hmm. You are now a futurist. Uh, right. You see, we're you're making a prediction. That's a futurist. But we're talking a professional futurist. A visionary might become a futurist just by making a prediction. But mm -hmm. uh, again, anybody that can predict is in a way a futurist. And I would like to even say, frankly, we're all futurists, if you really think about it. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so I'm trying to give you, but professional futurists, right. they tend to have to have some kind of methodology that helps them out. And I think, again, if you could, went back to my 1993 book, Technotrends, and uh, you would see me talking about uh, smartphones and uh, what we have and when they would come out, social media, all of those things way back in 93, uh, you can see there is a way to do it. But my, what I'm really telling every listener here is, I don't want to be the only guy on the planet that can do this. I want you to do it as well. That's why I write books. That's why I have learning systems. That's why I do all that stuff. <clears throat> and if you get right down to it, uh -huh. um, what I'm trying to do is to get people to become anticipatory rather than just reactionary or just agile because everybody is using agility as the key strategy to deal with the rapid acceleration of technological change. But you've got to understand that agility is a reactionary strategy. It's reacting as quickly as you can to a disruption after it disrupts, reacting as quickly as you can to a problem after it occurs. And that's half of the strategy coin for dealing with exponential change. The half that I'm bringing to the world is to be anticipatory. How to anticipate problems before you have them so you can pre-solve them and not have them in the first place. By the way, if we don't start doing that, we're not gonna be happy campers on planet Earth. <laughs> Secondly, how to anticipate disruptions before they disrupt so that you have the choice. And I mentioned earlier a phrase, becoming a positive disruptor. Let me just take a second of what that means because that's another concept I can't help but wanna share with an entrepreneurial group like this. And that is most people see disruption as negative. Why? Well, that's because it happens to them. And now they gotta be either agile or reactive in some way and do something different. But does uh, Elon Musk and does Jeff Bezos see uh, disruption as negative? Now, it's all the people that are disrupting that see it as negative. Well, you can do that too. So what I would like all of us to do is to become positive disruptors, creating the transformations that need to happen to elevate your relevance, to accelerate your innovation and growth, and more importantly, to make a better world instead of to wait and see how it will happen. 
because reactionaries still tend to wait and see. Let's learn how to become anticipatory. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it.